Hi everybody, I'm Roy Firestone and this is a brand new video web show on Kane Sport called UM Goats, which of course means the greatest of all time, in this case the Miami Hurricanes. And for our inaugural broadcast, we have a two-parter with the brand new coach for UM football, Mario Cristobal. Mario, of course, was the head coach at Oregon, built that program into national prominence, coached the Ducks to a Rose Bowl win. But Cristobal is coming home to probably the only job he ever really wanted, a place where, as a player, he played on two national championship teams, the Miami Hurricanes. Today in part one, we talk about the roots of his story, the inspirational figures in his life, the challenges and expectations ahead. We welcome Miami's Super Mario, Mario Cristobal. Coach, thank you very, very much for joining us. I know time is very precious and we respect that. Thank you for taking the time to talk with us, with us about Kane football. I appreciate you having me. It's an honor to be here. I want to throw a quote up at you that you said, and it was pretty simple and stark. And I want you to comment on a question off of it. It said this, you know, I live this. I live for the University of Miami. It means a lot. It means the world to all of us. I assume that means the Cristobal family. The cynic says, hey, they all say that stuff. You know, and a year and a half later, they got to deal with the Eagles or somewhere, and they're out of there. Why is this not the case for you? Oh, wow. There's, there's a ton of reasons why. I mean, it's, uh, I can remember ever since I could uh, get a ride hitch a ride, pedal a bike over here to practice to watch these legends on Green Tree practice field just go at it. Uh, just way after practice was over with, the one-on-ones watching Michael Irvin and Benny Blades get in some extra work after practice to the point where they looked like they were going to brawl. The Jerome Browns and Winston Mosses, the Alonzo Highsmiths just challenging each other after practice, getting more work, getting reps, watching my brother as a freshman. I'll go even before that, going to games when you used to be able to catch a free bus out there and get a free ticket. <laughs> oh, I, I just, I wanted to be a Miami hurricane. And then when I was able to be one, day one was frightening because the level of competition, but soon you realize a brotherhood that comes with it. I, that's that's I the word. That. That's the word, brotherhood. That's what you want to instill again, yeah. a brotherhood, right? Yes, sir. Yes, yeah, so yeah. I could go on and on about why. I mean, I remember sitting in the office with Butch Davis when Butch Davis was interviewing me for the GA job. And I'm like, man, I don't know if I want to be a GA. These guys go get laundry and they go park cars and they just make coffee. I don't know if they do much, but he says, well, listen, man, you're not going to make it to your friends' weddings and family occasions and birthdays and uh, holidays and all that stuff. Why, why do you want to do this? And I Looked at him and I said, I just, I want to sit in your seat one day. So that takes, now, by the way, that takes a little bit of nerve to tell the head coach, I want, basically, I want your job someday. <laughs> well, I mean, it was going to mean just that, you know, I mean, it was going to take a while, but this is, that was a goal and it was, it was a dream. And, uh, but when you start coaching football, you really lose sight of that. And you're not concerned about that because you love the profession. You love what in essence is a vocation, developing young men, young people. And I felt that I was blessed to be around great people and that helped me be good for young people. So it kind of was, it was gone. That dream was, was, it was out. It was out I had this unbelievable opportunity out West and we're doing great things, but it hit, it hit different. It hit hard and it hit home and right between the eyes, right smack right there. And this is a, uh, it's unbelievable. It still hasn't really set in. It's just been work, 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 because there's a lot of work to do and excited about every single part of it. Uh, but we all know what Miami is when Miami is done the right way. So that's what we're looking to do. We spoke to Lewis, your brother, your older brother, your big brother, and we're going to talk to him several times in this interview. But the day you, annou- you had the announcement, you, the welcome back, Mario, he was very passionate in what he said about his younger brother. I want you to watch this clip right here. Our parents came here, Cuban exiles, uh, that did nothing but work and showed us how to work and 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 taught us that that nobody's better than us, but you're not better than anybody. Everybody's the same, and this is the greatest country on earth. And if you work hard enough, you can accomplish anything. Work hard and work and work smart and be loyal. 
and be a good person. And I'm more proud of him because of that. He's a good person, he's a great person, man. And he's and he's earned this, man. And and we're and we're you know, like I said, from from a player standpoint, an ex an ex player standpoint, I'm thrilled, man, because it's because it's on. I mean, it's on. You guys were actually teammates on the same line, and this is a, a big thrill for him. There the two of you are together. Look at that picture. What did that big brother mean to you in your life? I know that there was a lot of fighting and you know bickering and battling and competing, but he still he was your big brother. And I want to know what he mat mattered to you for. Well, he was my greatest adversary in like our daily WrestleManias, that's for sure. You know, he's <laughs> he's a judo guy, more of a jujitsu guy. So those battles were epic and furniture was broken and there were holes in the wall, but it also led to a very competitive nature, one that was also fostered and nurtured in the home, as well as our high school head coach, Dennis Lavelle. Uh, that guy right there, he's um, he's the person I look up to most in this world um, because of the way he conducted himself. And then he patterned himself after my my father. So we're very simple. I mean, he he kind of explained it perfectly. We we had to go to work. That's all we knew. And we were good with that. And they used to tell us all the time, the best we could teach you is to work and I said is that it mom is that it dad's like yeah you got a lot of work to do buddy you gotta you gotta get to it you know we uh we came to this country to do it the right way we have this privilege now so we're not gonna let it slip away so very grateful for that we're gonna talk a little bit about your mom and your dad it's something tragically bittersweet because just as you were signing to become the new coach your dream was coming true this is a picture of course your mom clara and she was your biggest fan and also with Luis as well. Um, she wanted a girl. She got two boys. She wouldn't try for a third, she said, because it was hard enough with two big boys. Another boy would have been too much. Um, I want you to listen to your brother talking about her slipping away just as your dream is coming true. And I asked what it was like if your mom knew that you got the job. Did she ever grasp even in the final moments that Mario's dream came true? I believe so. Uh, I truly, truly believe so. There was times where she was in and out um, of, uh, of consciousness. Uh, although she, could, she couldn't speak because she, was, uh, she had a, a trach in, uh, she was first intubated. And then after a couple of weeks of being intubated, then uh, they had put in a trach. However, they were never able to put in a, a voice box. But she was able to communicate uh, like with her eyes and, you know, like squeezing our hands and stuff like that, uh, facial expressions and whatnot. Um, I, I'm at peace knowing that she was happy. She was happy. She was proud. Uh, she loved it. I'm 1000% uh, 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 certain that, that, that she loved it, that her boys are finally together again, uh, that Mario's here, Jessica's here, the boys. You know, our, our family, my, my wife, Elizabeth, our uh, children, Kaylee, Lewis, and, uh, and Richard, and that we're all together and that we're going to uh, uh, be living and raising our families together. So it was, it was awesome. It was a, it was a great moment um, to know that she knew because we constantly tell her also, you know, and, and uh, she would acknowledge that she understood. So that was cool. There's a quote from Twitter. I think it was your quote. You said, you pushed and you challenged us and you made us humble and hungry, taught us to earn everything, zero entitlement, and still loved us. Mama Cristobal, te quiero, mama. I love mama. Thoughts? It's uh, exactly, if she could have drawn it up herself, she would have drawn it up like this. And, um, you know, I, uh, on the day of her services, we had practice and I couldn't think of a better way to honor her than to make sure that we showed up and took care of our work, you know, uh, in front of our family, in front of our, our new family here at the University of Miami, rejoined again, and then to be able to also lay her to rest. So, yeah, all in all, it, um, you know, she, uh, a, her, her job was now complete and ours continues and begins again in a new chapter. So mm -hmm. grateful beyond words. Your father, L Luis Cristobal Sr., uh, was a tough guy, big, big dude. I mean, I think that's Cranon Park there, by the way, the first one. Uh, he was incarcerated, I was told, by Luis at one point in Cuba. 
um, and he, he taught you so much. I wonder if you could reflect on his influence on you as well. Just discipline, you know, for him, it, uh, to quote one of my old mentors, every day was a reckoning, just the way he was raised as well. He knew it. He knew it was a tough world. He knew it was going to take resiliency. And he knew that to give us the best chance, he had to work some ungodly hours. And he was going to hold us to a high standard. And he did. And he wasn't very flexible. Uh, not the, the warmest guy in the world, but his way of being was the kind of warmth that we needed. And he knew that. And so because of him and his way, uh, I think that's what really allowed us to succeed under a guy like Dennis Lillo and then Jimmy Johnson over here at the University of Miami. Mm -hmm. You know, you were the first Cuban-American to be a, a head coach in Division One A, I believe. Uh, I have a picture of you actually with Cuban food. Uh, I don't know what, what meal this is. I'm trying to decide what you would be able to tell me better. I know that's a little Cuban coffee right there. Question, is being a Cuban American coach in Dade County, Miami, and Florida, a little more pressure because there's a million, literally a million Cuban Americans believing you're their favorite son. And Carlos Alvarez started it 50 years ago, the Cuban Comet. But is there a higher expectation? Do you feel an obligation to the commu Cuban community on any level? I feel an obligation to Miami, its community, and its people. I think that was as much of a draw as anything. People, you know, we left a great team behind at Oregon. I'm talking about you You worked your tail off to get to your first senior class, right, when you're a coach. And a team of 22 is that, the three highest rated classes in Oregon history, you know, and people say, man, why would you leave that? It's like, well, one thing that stands out first and foremost, I played at Miami. And when you play somewhere and you love it, there's nothing like it. And then I think we all remember what Miami, the community, the city was when the hurricanes were just kicking butt at such a high level. Mm -hmm. it, was, it brought everybody together. And I feel like, like when I, for example, I went down to Chicken Kitchen um, by the time I parked, got off, got my chop chop and got back in the car, ran to my uh, high school position coach. I ran to a little league baseball coach and a guy <laughs> I to school with. And it's like that every day in the very few moments I get out in public. So I, it's just time for Miami to get back to work and start working towards reestablishing a certain level a certain standard as it relates to University of Miami hurricane football. And yeah, I feel a very strong obligation, but in terms of pressure, I don't, I don't live in a pressure type world. I don't, I never, I don't know how to explain it. I've always, what people refer to as pressure. I've always looked at it as opportunities to test yourself, right? Let's go find out. Let's go find out where we are, what we're made of. So I feel more, uh, I, more of a privilege and honor an opportunity as it relates to anything else. You know, there are so many people who, in coaching in my career that really inspired me with words. Jim Balvana was one. I never got to interview Vince Lombardi, but, you know, 50 or 60 years ago, his words resonated. But I, I got to tell you, Mario, your words are pretty close to that stuff. We have a collection of some of your observations and a montage of your philosophy as a coach. You've said it, but I want the folks to hear it, and then you react to it. I feel like I've never completely left the locker room in high school or in college. I even think about that all the time before making any kind of major decision, before implementing a process. But let me put on the cleats instead of the loafers. And let me think about what that generates inside of me from a feeling standpoint, from a trust standpoint. Well, I, I never thought I'd get into coaching. I mean, I got into it because I was working public relations back in Coral Gables. I go to the games and they didn't look too good. And my, my good friend was coaching there. I would fax over, hey, man, try this. You know, you could help protect me. And one day he just says, hey, why don't you just come over here and interview to be a graduate assistant and help the program where you played at? This whole thing has got to be based on trust. And there's no way you could trust each other unless you have worked your tail off with each other and by each other. And that's the only way accountability is going to come about. And you just start talking and telling your story. You'd be surprised at what comes out of you uh, not to mention what comes back at you. Mm, very strong. Um, but self-doubt, 
Is it still there way back in the recesses of your mind? Is there some anxiety? Is there some, I'll use the word fear of not being able to, to compete on, on, at your, the level you want to? Is there any fear in me? <laughs> no. no, we just, I've never lived in that world of fear. I've never blamed it on my parents or give my parents credit for, for that part of it. I, uh, I don't, it's not something that quite fathoms or that I can fathom. Um, Anything keep you up late at night? When, when you sleep, Mario, which is rare. Yeah, I just, I've been blessed to be driven. I get this, I've been blessed to be a very boring human being, which means <laughs> I get to devote my time to this. And, and luckily I have an unbelievable wife and family that allows me to just dive into this. I'm let's, gonna... let's show, let's show some folks what, what that beautiful family looks like and talk about the sacrifices they have to make as well. Go ahead. Yeah, no, they're just, they're unbelievable. They know, um, um, I've always been obsessed with football. I mean, I was a guy who, you know, my mom used to look over in church and say, oh, wow, I'm so proud of him. He's praying for the family. I'd be like, no, I'm praying for the Pittsburgh Steelers to win on Sunday. I'm not praying for anything else. I love football. And they know how much this means to me. And I've been blessed enough to make this vocation a, a true career. But they also know that in order for us to have uh, success, that it's going to require just about every ounce of what we have. So they allow me to marry them into the program as well and our team uh, and integrate them in just about everything we do. So yeah, it's, uh, it really does require all of that. At least for me, it does. I mean, I, I don't know how other people do it. I just, uh, but in terms of, man, I just never, I've never grasped the concept of fear. I've always grasped the concept of being driven and being very motivated. No one, uh, I just remember being a player here and walking into a locker room Maybe that's the one time I felt self-doubt when I walked into that locker room and those guys were unbelievably talented. And I was like, man, can I really hang with these guys? Yeah. And after they kicked your butt for a couple of weeks, those guys put their arm around and say, hey, come here, young buck. You're, you're, you're one of us. We won't show you the way. We're still going to kick your butt, but we're going to help you elevate yourself and this team on a daily basis. And I think, I think when you become a Miami Hurricane, and you go through the Miami hurricane process with the great coaches and mentors that we had and had the, exp the championship experience that we had, it's a game changer. And, and I had the opportunity to do that and that changed me forever. And maybe that's why I've been blessed to have a mindset that allows us to keep forging and go forward, man. I'm, I'm, I'm excited beyond, I can't even, I can't explain, describe, write down, the level of enthusiasm, excitement, and energy that uh, we have been pouring and that we will be pouring into this thing. It's unbelievable. I thought I read that Joe Paterno was an influence for you. That's one of the reasons you wore the tie, too, like Al Golden did. Oh, oh no, no. The reason I wore a tie was because our first game was against Penn State, and uh, when we went to the locker room, it got changed up. They had, uh, they had ordered the wrong size pants and clothing, and all of a sudden, we're like, what the heck do I wear? I'm like, fun. I'm going to go out there. I got to go out there in my tie. And uh, we got blasted 59 to nothing. <laughs> and the newspaper said, man, what a nice gesture by the young FIU coach <laughs> to wear a tie to honor Coach Paterno. And the president of FIU was like, man, that was really cool. Next thing you know, I'm stuck wearing a tie for a year. So, <laughs> so it wasn't really a big influence, Joe Paterno, in terms of your idol, as, as your mentor as a coach. Never. I, that's about as far out of left field as I could know. He never was. Okay. I do know that Jimmy Johnson meant a hell of a lot to you, though. And I asked him about what's ahead for Mario or what's the advantage that Mario has, as well as some of the tough challenges. Watch. I think the biggest thing with Mario is he's been in a big program. He's been on the big stage. He knows what it takes. And fortunately, with the alumni, for the first time that I can ever remember, and for the first time it's ever happened, the alumni have stepped in and are donating money to make sure it's big time football. You know, there's expectations that, hey, he's coming home and we're going to all of a sudden, day one, be back where we were. 
uh, it's going to be hard. You know, it, it's not going to be as easy as that with crystal ball and with the staff and with the way they're going about things, they can win that division and that conference. And so they can take some steps going back to where we were. Do you think the fans might be expecting too much too soon? Obviously they have every right to expect, you know, greatness, but is it expecting too much too soon, Mario? Well, I think anytime you're in a city like Miami, well, let's just focus strictly on Miami. Miami's always going to have high expectations. I also think that, you know, this is such a sports town that people, at least us on this side, understand that when you build a football program, Unfortunately, there's some painful steps you cannot skip. You just can't. You know, um, Coach Johnson, I think, uh, has always has some wise words. He was unbelievable here when he spoke at our clinic. You know, he could tell you himself, you know, they, they walked into a great situation back in the day, but still there were some, some learning moments and some painful steps before it got going. And that was a team that just won a national championship. You right. Know? Yep. Um, our, our current team is uh, – Maybe a lot like, like when we first got to Oregon. We first got to Oregon. Oregon was four and eight. You know, and a couple of years later, we're we're twelve and two, and we're a top five team, and we're winning the Rose Bowl. Uh, but there were painful steps on the way there, and it requires everything. Their cultural standards; they can never sleep. Your player development has to be at at the highest levels imaginable. Your your talent influx, your recruiting levels have to go through the roof. The buy-in has to come from everybody because of the tough moments that come with that. And it starts within the walls of the program, the players and the staff, you know, the, the level of trust that has to be built. It has to be done by investing time. That's what we're doing now. I mean, we've done everything from the hard work that it's, it's what would, would absolutely crush a normal human being out there. The amount of work that we're putting into mm-hmm. they're going down to the water park and taking some speedboat rides and, and, eating at Texas to Brazil till we explode, you know, we're investing quality time where guys that would never ever come across or cross paths with another position group are actually sitting beside each other and talking and sweating and grinding. And that's what football in the locker room has always been about when you're a good football team. If it comes down to this, when you play the game of football, it has to show that it means more to you than the guys on the other side of the field. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, Jimmy, Jimmy talked to us. I was going to say, Jimmy talked to us, though, about another ingredient that you may or may not be on the same page with. And that word is swagger. Watch this clip. It's called something that started right here in my swagger. And people get confused about swagger. Sometimes they look about the old Miami teams and they said swagger was celebrating. No, swagger was confidence. You're confident that you're going to kick somebody's ass. Is that your style? 100%. His definition of swagger is on point. A confidence that came from the amount of work done out there on Green Tree practice field was unmatched. I'm talking about decades and decades of the best players in pro and college football working to a level that no one else could fathom that led to a level of confidence that gave way to that word swagger. I agree with Coach. It's not the dancing. It's not the talking. It's the confidence that comes with time invested. And you, talk, you took the, 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 the turnover chain and the touchdown chain out. Some might say, hey, come on, let them have some fun. That's a little swagger. Why did you take it out? I just, I respect everything and everyone that has ever gone to University of Miami. Miami's had their highs and lows like anyone else. So I certainly, it's not uh, a shot uh, at anyone or anything. It just doesn't fit what we're trying to do. It doesn't fit the focus of our program. Our focus right now is, going from the worst tackling team in the country to being one of the better tackling teams in the country, from being one of the more penalized teams in the country to being the best at not being penalized in the country. Our focus has to be on us and where our feet are, because if we do that, you know what, it's going to be really, really hard 
to beat Miami. And we have to establish certain standards by how we operate. And how you do anything is how you do everything. And right now, there's just really no place for that. That, that focus, that extra two seconds of focus on that should be invested in better technique and fundamentals and bending at the knees and coming out of our hips and striking people so we can play better football. Mm. I'm going to take some stops for you in coaching and what you learned and what you took away from them as a head coach. We'll start with FIU. At one point, this program lost 23 straight football subdivision games, which is a record at that point. It lasted six years, 27-47 overall record, 20 and 26 in the Sun Belt. Um, they fired you in 2010. Were they right? to fire you, or would you have loved to have one more chance to sh prove them all wrong? Oh, I don't think we were rightfully terminated. And I say that because we took over an 0-12 program that was making the jump to Division I that was to lose anywhere between 20 and 30 scholarships that was going to be given a five-year probation that was going to be given the APR contemporaneous penalty, which means that anybody that's ineligible costs you another scholarship, all while making the move to Division I. Uh, but the good news is your out-of-conference schedule is going to be Alabama, Florida, Pittsburgh, and Kansas. So we took a job knowing that you're going to have to – you're going to get kicked around for three years before you start looking like a program. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, like when talking to young coaches, they say, man, would you advise someone to make a move like that? I say, look, I always take – actually, Mark Rick's old words when he was uh, – I witnessed him speak at a clinic – where if you can win in recruiting, if you have the support of the administration and you can win the conference, it's worth looking at a job to take. And did you, that's did why you, I took that job. Co Coach, did you feel when they terminated you, it motivated you to prove them wrong down the road? Because we're going to now show you at Alabama. And, uh, you know, obviously you, you coach with, with your co-head coach with Nick Saban. Was there a chip on your shoulder to say, I'm going to show these people they, they cut me too quickly, and I'm going to make them remember me. Something like that, or is that not in your mindset? Well, it was more the mindset of the place had been uh, had set the, the national record for most losses in a row, and we made it a conference champion. It's only conference championship it's had. Um, it's first bowl game and first bowl victory that it's ever had, and followed up with uh, the most win total of the season they've ever had, all to be taken away from us when we had a bad year. We went three and nine. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, we, I felt uh, it was especially a place that had no resource. I mean, the stories are legendary. I mean, we sat on the runway for, I think, seven or eight hours because the, the bill hadn't been, hadn't been paid and we were about to go play Alabama. And we had no plane to fly in. And the buses didn't pick us up to go scrimmage at the Orange Bowl because no one had paid the bus bill. And there, there was no, is that, is that really, that's really true, huh? Oh, yeah, yeah. We, uh, I remember a staff meeting saying, all right, what car do you have? Well, I got a Fiat. Okay, you take the two kickers, go. You know, it was <laughs> it was unbelievable. Leaving North Texas after a big conference win and getting a tap on the shoulder. Oh, by the way, we, we weren't allowed to pay for food and water on the way back. So having to stop at Burger King and have coaches like stuff bagged with fries and work with the management at Burger King out there. In, wow. In Texas to, unbelievable. But cutting your teeth at that level and having to deal with that, really prepare you for when you go to a place like Alabama and then you have every resource and you're learning from the best, of the best uh, in an attempt to get really what equates to your PhD in coaching. But um, when I, when I did get fired, I wanted, I wanted to go and learn to a level where, you know what, I'm never going to allow myself and this staff to be put in that situation again. I mean, I always, I always, I stay mad. Like, you know, the, one of the best sports psychology just states I've ever been around is Sabrina Lonescu out there at Oregon. And I'd always ask her, what you always your mindset in today's game. She said, I just stay mad. I just don't want to keep kicking butt. And I'm like, wow. Comp competitively angry is oh, the way I, and just, I, I, I would. Yeah, I thought it was as competitively as astute as I've ever heard in my life. Someone articulate how they feel and how they approach things mentally and I've always, uh, I believe in that. And I, uh, I like that. I like being in that mental state and that just added a lot to it, a lot more. And so uh, when I was given that opportunity by coach David, I was extremely grateful. Let's go to Oregon before we move on back to Miami again. 
uh, you, as you mentioned, you inherited a, a program that was getting pretty good players, but you had some tough times. What did you take away from that experience after Coach Taggart left? Well, I thought Coach Taggart um, was an awesome uh, person to give me an opportunity out there. And what we started learning was that if we really, you know, if we work together as a staff, that we can certainly recruit better, but also that if we don't make advances, you know, in, um, in all our processes that we're in a competitive league, you know, Oregon had been down, Oregon had been really good for a while and then they're taking a step back, a massive uh, step back and going four and eight. And, uh, but we felt that we could take the next step in the trenches that if we could control the line of scrimmage by really investing in the bigs, their development, recruitment, technical, fundamental work, and then our schemes that we can really take control of the conference and the conference that has some great teams. And uh, in the four years as a head coach, we won the conference twice, competed uh, for the conference title a third year. So a lot of good things were accomplished. A lot of lessons learned. You know, we've won some big games, won a, went to a New Year's six twice, won one of them, won the Rose Bowl, uh, got a top five finish. Um, we were the only program in the country, I believe, to have three straight top 10 picks. And there's probably another couple sitting for the next couple of years. That's uh, there's, you can't imagine a team more loaded with talent than what was left behind there and certainly wishing them the best, but. Uh, was it, was it hard to leave Mario? It was. I mean, obviously your dream job was Miami, but was there part of you that your heart was still there a little bit in the whole process? Of course you don't, I I've never ever worked at a job thinking about a next job and this one, when it came, it came suddenly and it hit and it hit really hard. And it was still very difficult because we had entrenched ourselves. We had planted our, our roots there in Eugene and uh, the people had been very good to us and we had had success and the mm -hmm. future is the future of the football program we had assembled and the culture of it was very bright. You know, no team had a recruiter developed at that level um, over the last four years. And there's some great football teams in that conference as well. So, yeah, and our kids were being raised there. Our, our kids were too small to remember Miami and Tuscaloosa. They mm -hmm. remember and they know Eugene, Oregon. So all that stuff made it difficult. We have a, a, a tweet from an old friend of yours, and it goes like this. Mario was the absolute best teammate and workout partner. We got after it in the weight room, kicked each other's asses in practice, made each other better. I'm proud of his success, and I believe he will guide our canes to greatness. Dwayne the Rock Johnson. Uh, there's a, a shot of the two of you together. Uh, I don't know how often you speak to him. I don't know if he's going to help you recruit or come to school and talk, but talk about that relationship when you when you were at school with him. We need more defensive linemen that look like him. That's, a, that's the most important thing. Dwayne was a, a relentless competitor and a great football player and a great teammate. Uh, just always grinding, a uh, very unselfish, total team guy, and uh, did some great, great things here at the University of Miami. I remember I remember him on his recruiting visit, you know. I got to be part of the, the entourage that hosted him and a couple other guys that came on down. So, um, obviously, he, uh, he honors the University of Miami in so many things that he's done. He's gone on to be um, I, w I wouldn't even say arguably the biggest star, right? No, no question. No question. No question. And, uh, you know, I know he's got a lot of things going on, but yeah, he still finds time to plug in the University of Miami. And hopefully we'll get him around our guys because he's got a great story to tell. It's not just the success that he has had. It's the way he has grinded and worked into being successful and how much time and energy he pours into helping people. Yeah, Dwayne, uh, Dwayne Johnson's a special human being, a special athlete, and uh, certainly super happy for him and his success. Mario Cristobal, he's focused and energetic, intensely motivated, maybe the most organized, I think the most ambitious and the most passionate coach Miami has seen since Jimmy Johnson for sure, or maybe even Don Shula, who came to Miami at age 40 and led the Dolphins to three Super Bowls and back-to-back -back world titles. In part two, Mario will talk about Don Shula and how some are trying to draw a parallel in his quest with Don's. That's part two of our interview with Mario Cristobal. I'm Roy Firestone. This is GOATS. We'll see you for part two. Thanks for watching. See you next time.